Thanks, Ashley. Uh, while we are waiting for our uh, next set of speakers as well, uh, we just want to give a warm welcome to Rui uh, as well. Uh, Rui, could you want to introduce yourself before we kickstart uh, this session with you and the other speakers? You have an amazing background from China Tech and Chinese consumers working with them. Oh, sure. Me, right. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Ray, and I am a Chinese American right now uh, talking to you from Silicon Valley, where I grew up. I also worked in China from 2007 to 2015, where I had the good fortune to meet many of the people in this room. And I continue to be plugged in into China, especially on the technology front, because I'm now running my own company, um, started as a podcast called Tech Buzz China, which is really explaining Chinese tech to uh, U.S. listeners, but actually have a global audience, so anyone who speaks English. And then uh, I have now uh, been able to turn that into a business consulting funds, investors, and operators, anyone who wants to understand more about China Tech and learn from it. So really excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Hi, Rui. Hi, George. Great, great, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so as this uh, session is all about consumers, right? And uh, just to set the expectation, we are having the second session from now until 1 p.m. China time. And it's all about Chinese consumers, uh, how the mindset, the behaviors of the Chinese consumers are changing. Is there a thing called a Chinese consumer in the first place? Um, so for the next 20 minutes, so we'll open the discussion with the speakers and their point of view. And then right after that, we'll open the floor with the audience chiming in with their questions and learnings and point of view. Let's try to keep it story based, please. More humanizing real life experiences and not theory. So just to kickstart a question I'll actually ask also to Ashley, but also to Brian and uh, Roy as well. Uh, is there a thing like a Chinese consumer? You know, having worked here for 16 years, uh, my, you know, uh, modest observation is not really there is not like one Chinese consumer. What is your take uh, on this definition of Chinese consumers and why? Well, let me start. I think that there's no such thing as one Chinese consumer. China is such a huge country with so many regional differences. And most prominently, the south and west of China are extremely different historically, culturally. So the economic recovery during COVID, post-COVID are also, you know, extremely different. So this is a big difference. Of course, there are CTTs. Of course, there are different subgroups. And uh, essentially, when entering China, I think this is the most important decision for businesses to really go and do the deep dive to understand how their, who their consumer in China really is and how to reach them, how to speak with them, what do they want, who are, you know, other businesses they're purchasing services from. So uh, there's no just one Chinese consumer. There's a lot of stereotypes out there. But in my view, there are a very complicated, very sophisticated and very interesting <laughs> collection of consumer groups. Holger. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me here, Nishta and everybody. And um, yeah, I want to build on what Ashley just said. It's very true. You have so many regional or cultural differences in China. And not only that, it's, um, it's also evolving into new mindsets that are coming up. So within specific groups, for instance, age groups or demographic groups, um, you have, you find so many segments which are characterized by completely different approaches to life or discoveries about life and different mindsets. And um, that is actually something that we feel that um, a lot of brands have um, not been in tune with and really neglected. I haven't kind of found out about that, but it's really important how different mindsets um, impact um, um, consumerism, uh, perceptions, um, what people want for their lives, what kind of how they look at brands, how they look at products and um, how they want to shape their lifestyle. So um, I can share a couple of um, stories here, but, you know, that's we can, my own. Yeah, we, we can come back to that, Holger, but please, could you just give a very quick introduction under a minute? You have over 30 years experience in China. So that's a very interesting background for our audience to know. Uh, yeah, I came to Shanghai in 1996, and before that, I spent a couple of years in Guangdong, when it was still the Wild West. Um, 
And um, yeah, when I came to Shanghai, they started building the flyovers. Line one metro was being built, was to, had just opened. So um been uh, in consumer insights, more on the psychological, emotional brand strategy, uh, communication side. Um, so that's my day job. And then um, we also uh, into creative, but more on the storytelling side. So I'm also a filmmaker, a screenwriter, I've been writing for Chinese productions as well as um, American productions and uh, very much on a cross-cultural uh, dimension. So um, everything is connected to China and um, looking at the commonalities, differences between certain Western cultures and, um, and China. So, yeah, that's my background. Thank you so much. Let's also quickly introduce and welcome uh, Manshu from eMarketer. Quick introduction and uh, what's your definition of a Chinese consumer? Is there a thing like Chinese consumer? Hi, everybody. So, yeah, I work for eMarketer. Um, if you don't know about the company, it's actually a market research company. So we mainly focus on um, digital advertising, e-commerce, social and mobile. And uh, of course, uh, Chinese consumers is also part of that equation as well. So I've been with the company for about um, eight years as the China Japan research analyst, but mainly um, writing um, reports, articles, doing research, and things like that. And before joining the company, um, I was with the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, mainly working to attract Chinese investment into the city of New York. So a pleasure to be here. Um, as far as the answering the question, uh, whether there's like one definition for Chinese customer, there's definitely, definitely not. And I think increasingly so is uh, we are seeing more and more sub-segment. So yeah, um, I'm sure we'll get into this topic a little bit more later on. Sure, thank you. Chen Yu, a quick intro and your point of view on a thing called Chinese consumer. Hi, th thank you, Nishita, and thanks for the opportunity to share here. My name is Chen Yu and also known as Miss Apple in China. I'm a lifestyle uh, KOL uh, with over 200,000 followers. And I interact with uh, different uh, consumers on a daily basis. And my background is in marketing with uh, Uber and other tech companies. So in my definition, I think the Chinese consumer is like what Holger said, uh, it's very diverse. There's so many different segments. But what I want to point out is that the Chinese consumers are bombarded with a lot of information sending to their uh, phone on a daily basis. So the, the Chinese consumers are very, very internet savvy. They kind of know what they want and uh, they're they are facing different kind of promotions on a daily basis whether it's live streaming from v v via or austin lee like the top like um influencers in the live streaming space or they will be facing like um double single day promotion or the um june 18th promotion uh, every month so uh, a lot of times they are looking for a uh, really good price like a uh, really good price products and the other uh, thing i want to point out is like so a lot of brands um, used to focus on tier one or tier two city consumers but actually now a new trend is called with a lot of disposable income and they don't have like the debt to to pay, pay for their house so the third and fourth tier city consumers are becoming a mainstream uh, force of purchasing the same kind of products the first tier or second tier city um, consumers are buying so that's a new area that i think every brand should pay attention and because everyone has the same information on their fingertip it's so easy to sit in their home and just buy it on top out so uh, that's my uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. You know, they just just reminded, I was reading something recently <clears throat> about this whole silver uh, economy or the silver lining group amongst the Chinese consumers about 
18 to 20 percent of the total population of China, if I'm not wrong, is is already the elderly population over 60. And uh, very often uh, we see brands uh, identifying the target audience definition to oh, 20 to 35 or 30 to 45, you know, by age or by city or demographics. And there is a huge debate on why is the elderly population being ignored? They have such high disposable income, as Chenyu mentioned. Um, so I think just to bring back to the topic that there are different shades of consumers, right? From super moms to pet lovers. Ashley has been doing some research work with her company on that as well. Uh, the lower tier, um, the happy singles. So, you know, there are different shades. So my question to the uh, speakers here, uh, opening it up, that... Let's not assume that even, for example, within silver hair types, they're all traditional or outdated or old. They are as much as trendsetters and innovators. And this actually came up in a discussion with Holger last evening when we met uh, for a clubhouse gathering in Shanghai, right? So if you, any of you may share a real project or a real go-to-market experience which confirms this fact, don't assume that a certain segment is a certain mindset, any any point of view on that? Yeah, Holger, Nishka, you since that? you called me out here. Uh, yeah, I wanted to offer something on the silver generation. Everybody talks about Gen Z and millennials, and they're very important. But um, you know that China is an aging society. And as you pointed out, you've got um, an increasing um, elderly population with huge purchasing power. But it's not only that, um, what we've seen a lot of brands who've been venturing into the silver segment, they've kind of entrapped themselves in two common stereotypes. And the first one is, you know, they're more or less all the same. They're old, retired, they're taking care of their grandchildren, yada, yada, yada. And the second one is that they don't seem to have much expectations um, for themselves anymore. They're kind of happy to give, they support their adult kids financially, little expectations for themselves in their remaining years, but that's a huge fallacy. Um, first of all, they're not just one homogenous group. They segment into many tribes and groups. And as I mentioned earlier, the main characteristics are not demographic differences, but differences in mindset and um, relating to what they want out of their remaining years, which are quite a lot they feel, their attitudes on life, how they've, they've seen how life has been changing for themselves, for their families, and how it continues to change. And they want to be active members of those transformations, of those changes. They want to be creative. They want to be innovators. And they're also very much self-focused now. Um, for instance, we've been tracking, setting up panels for some brands, we've been tracking um, several tribes, elderly tribes. And for instance, there's recently there's a group of elderly ladies who are setting up an adult toy online shop, so a sex toy online shop, targeting elderly customers because they feel they deserve the same sex appeal and high quality sex life as everybody else. So um, pretty unique. You wouldn't have come across that in China five or 10 years ago. Others are completely changing their lives. Some, A lot of them are getting divorced, seeking a new partner or staying single and being happy often against the wishes of their adult kids um, and pursuing activities that would have been unthinkable again five or ten years ago. And um, so what's the implication really of what I wanted to share is um, uh, the implication for brands here is you really need to go and understand their mindsets, um, not just treat them as one superficially homogenous group of elderly silver generation people, but understand what are their mindsets? What do they want out of life? What do they? A lot of them feel life owes them now. They've been giving a lot. They've been helping build and the, the changes, power the changes of this country. It's not just the government. It's actually the people who've been building the miracle here. And um, they, they kind of feel they're, they're not bitter, not at all. They're very positive, but they feel that life owes them and they, they, they deserve more and they deserve happiness and they deserve to be creative. And they don't want to be treated as imbeciles who need to be educated in terms of taste and style and whatever is good for their health and so on. They know that. Um, they want to be treated as creators. They want to be inspired. They want to be given the tools, the mindset, the practical tools to make something even better of their lives, to, to go and to create a new space of life, a new experience, to then also they continue contributing to society. But, you know, they, they've actually given their share in many ways. 
Um, but they're really more self-focused now. So the implication is treat them as creators, not just as rich consumers who will pass away in a few years' time, but as creators and give them inspiration and empower them in many ways. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to share briefly. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to build on Holger's point? Treat them as creators. Absolutely. And I would also like to give a couple of examples to illustrate exactly what Holger is talking. For example, you traditionally think of uh, grandparents, especially in the north, again, uh, referring to the north and south of China having very different mindsets, but especially grandparents in the north being very traditional and wanting to basically raise children, grandchildren, etc. But right now we see a growing desire of those above 65 to actually move in together. Think about a communal house for like two to three families. They're moving in together to the outside of Beijing. So they rent a villa and they essentially uh, get together. They cook together. They go out together. They have hobbies together. So many of them, uh, let's say if they are gentlemen, they actually have a hobby, which is photography. So they go to the park, they hire a model or they uh, take pictures of the birds, et cetera, et cetera. And they live in this communal, very interesting homes and villas and enjoy the lifestyle before Obviously, 2020, they would also organize groups and essentially small groups like uh, four people, six people and go traveling together to explore the world. Also, if you right now are curating any content on, let's say, Chinese short video platform Douyin, you will see that we have more and more elderly bloggers appearing. Some of them are couples talking about their lifestyle, sharing advice on love, family, fashion even. Um, some of them are for example, there's very famous uh, four ladies that are all above 75 years old and they dress in beautiful hanfus and essentially they just flash their, um, you know, new lifestyle, which is very unusual for people to watch. They see these elderly ladies, but uh, wearing high heels in beautiful cheap house, walking the streets, enjoying their lives, going to coffee shops. And they very often talk about this contrast, saying that the choice is yours. You can be you know, dancing in the square and there's nothing wrong with that. Or you can be, you know, living a life that you choose. So that is definitely happening. And that's just to build on a couple of examples of what Holger has just now said. Awesome. You know, of course, uh, for any brands, a lot of people in the audience are mixed uh, right from US to China to, to some of them from other parts of the world. And a lot of questions come up around brands wanting to enter China as well, or brands who want to create new you know, innovation within the China market. I mean, we have to stop thinking of uh, just demographics. I mean, that's the key takeaway and, and uh, them as uh, different shades and insights. So anybody else, maybe Chen Wei, you do you want to uh, share any real project or go-to-market experience on the sub-segments around, for example, eco-friendly? So we've spoken about silver economy, silver uh, generation. What about eco-friendly? Because eco-friendly consumers is also a sub-segment emerging in China. Uh, sure, yes. I work with brands like uh, Oatly, the Swedish oatmeal brand, uh, oatmeal drink brand that has exploded in China, China over the last two years, as well as all birds, the um, eco-friendly shoe and fashion brand from Silicon Valley, uh, Omni Pork, and they do plant-based um, meat and Everlane, like brands like that. So um, uh, I noticed that there is a increasing demand for kind of the sustainability and eco-friendly component. I want to give an example of how Oatly spread it in China. First of all, I think when a foreign brand enters China, it's important to find uh, the right partner. So Oatly um, actually has a joint venture or main uh, investment stake from a, a Chinese uh, conglomerate that owns a lot of supermarkets and as as well as coffee shops in China. So when they first entered in China, they already have shelf spaces in prominent spaces, but that didn't make it popular. So <clears throat> back in 2018 uh, and in 2019, Oatly has a strategy called a one city, one product. So basically one segment. So the city is Shanghai. The, basically, if you live in Shanghai or have visited Shanghai, the amount of coffee shops, specialty coffee shops is just like as prevalent as the yoga studios in Los Angeles. So just give you a kind of vivid example. Um, so uh, Oatly has this bar barista uh, version. So the gray one, that is a perfect for making latte art. Uh, if you have uh, 
tried mostly in America or in Europe. Normally, you get the blue version, not like the um, uh, the gray version that that's for um, basically for barista edition. But in China, they pivoted the strategy, so they make that actually a product itself, and you can buy them in coffee shops. And every specialty coffee is like a KOC in their community. They start use Oatly, and people try it. It's experiential marketing. Um, people really liked it, and it became kind of um, very popular. So I think uh, the importance be behind the eco-friendly product is it has to be really, really, really good product first. And when people try it, they fall in love with you first. So if it's just eco-friendly, but it's not very attractive or it doesn't taste or uh, taste very good, it wouldn't last long. And But what really made Oatly take off last year was its collaboration with Starbucks. So the other thing, besides finding the right partner, right investment partner, and also operating partner, uh, having the right strategy of uh, focusing on uh, at first Shanghai and one product and one segment, the coffee goers. Uh, the more important one uh, to make it more mainstream is finding the right partner with so many distribution channels and stores in China, which is Starbucks. And Starbucks over the years um, has been focusing more on sustainability. They publish uh, actually a coffee uh, booklet about how they work with the farmers in Ring None, what they are doing in the eth ethical sourcing, how they are using their um, coffee grounds and making them into products. So Starbucks was already uh, uh, turning towards sustainability and how they tell their story through sustainability. And then they've um, Oatly and Omnipork and Beyond Meat uh, worked with uh, Starbucks last year with a big campaign. If you have Weibo or other China platform, I recommend you look up a Starbucks Good For You, Good For The Planet campaign, Good Good campaign. I thought it was one of the most successful sustainability sustainability campaign I've seen um, in my own research. They, taught, they um, illustrate a very uh, vivid story, just like what Peggy normally tells us about, you know, sharing the future you want to see in so such great detail that everyone wants to follow. Um, and that made Oatly a mainstream product that everyone was trying, willing to try even in fourth, like third or fourth tier cities. So that's just an example. Thanks so much, Chenu. Is it possible that you can drop that example link in any form, no matter Chinese link plus any English link about this case uh, in the group chat, in the WeChat group chat, all, where all the audience and the speakers are already in. I think people will really benefit. Yeah. And uh, anybody else uh, before we move on to the more depth of uh, this space of the consumer, anything you have observed about the sub segments and how you know, uh, they are the really the right ones to go and the changing mindsets of these sub segments. Okay, so just to just to move on, I think picking on what Holger said that it is not about the demographics, but about the mindsets, right? So, what is the reason that is exemplifying this rapid changing mindset behavior? When you spoke spoke about the elderly women uh, building a business around sex toys, uh, Holger. What is the psychological or other background which is actually influencing this change rapidly? Yeah, it's um, it's quite a few elements. Um, and one is that they feel they have more opportunities. Um, in the past, go back 20 years, 15 years, it was all about um, earning money, getting a good job, um, buying, a, buying an apartment um, when they were being built here. Uh, in all the cities. So that was on top of their mind. That was a um, the dominant um, thought that um, um, drove people through their daily lives. But that's changed. I mean, they've, um, they've all got all that. Um, they fulfilled all those needs. And um, the country, the culture, everything, um, entertainment, um, diversity in, in opinion, in, in many ways, and others maybe less, um, they offer a lot more opportunities. Um, that's one thing. And um, naturally, with so much activity in the market, different brands, you've got so many categories, you've got um, so many voices, commercial voices, which give them inspiration of what is possible, who you can be, how you can present yourself, uh, project yourself to the world, to society. 
uh, there's a huge difference if you compare today with, to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and even earlier, of course. And that gives inspiration that um, it also redirects focus to who do I actually want to be? You know, I've been playing a role. I am supposed to play a role, but I don't really have to do that 24 hours a day in certain parts of life as a wife, as a husband, as, as whatever, as whoever in a certain job I have to, there's, there are certain expectations and I cannot escape them, but I do have room. There is a lot of space that life allows me, gives me, provides me now where I can be somebody I really want to be, okay. where I look and, and play uh, different roles. And I think that is a, that is a key driver. And so people explore um, who can I be? It's really about self-identity. And that in turn changes mindset. And that in turn also changes mindset when it comes to very specific um, life spaces and, and specific product categories. So you then go into a product category and you, 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 you're surprised how diverse thinking there uh, is in that particular category. So I think that's one of the driving elements. Great. Wanting to play different roles, a sense of self-identity, what about entrepreneurship? Like, I think somewhere we heard somebody talking about that this whole fact that we can have a second income stream or we can have uh, more recognition. That's also a driver, right? Anybody else in the speakers who want to share um, what are the key drivers for these sub-segments, uh, for their needs, for their aspirations? Manchu? Are <laughs> Yeah, I guess Go I ahead. could kind of speak to this. Um, so I'm just like constantly um, impressed and surprised about how um, the economic growth in, in China brought about the prosperity and also the changes that are brought about by these tech companies, these internet company, And now like consumers are really um, benefiting from these technology and, you know, with the growing income, they're looking for like lifestyle upgrades. And we're looking into like things like smartphone control, hair dryers, Dyson vacuums and, you know, EVs and such and such. It's just, um, it, it just surprised me how much um, consumer have this kind of yearning for um, high tech products and always seeking out the, the latest greatest, um, sexiest products. Um, so that's my point. Yeah. I can jump in a little bit. I think, at least from my perspective, what's really interesting is the opportunity for micro or maybe even nano entrepreneurship for a much greater part of the Chinese population precisely because of this uh, evolution of digital capabilities. And I think a great example is, uh, you know, the we've seen last year, especially because of COVID, uh, a lot more, um, a lot more agricultural products were, for example, being sold online through live streaming e-commerce because this this became like sort of a national initiative. Uh, I, I don't think it was as successful as maybe <laughs> everyone thought it was, but I think in overall, I would say it really contributed to um, at least a lot more people being more aware and being more connected to uh, the, the real lifestyles um, of some of these uh, farmers, right? Or or in some cases, it's not necessarily farmers, but also artisans, um, because they were now, it was more democratized and decentralized, and they could uh, get an audience and show people what they were working on, uh, you know, live, how they were honing their craft and being able to connect with the audience in a more authentic way. I think that's really interesting. And of course, uh, because of the ubiquitous uh, WeChat platform and other platforms, but I think WeChat in particular, you've seen that, um, you know, stay at home moms uh, in the past decade has had a lot of opportunities to do micro entrepreneurship, whether it be for online only brands, or more recently, there's a lot more, uh, there's opportunities like, you know, helping these uh, platforms sell groceries and other sundries through community group buying. Uh, there's just a lot of um, places where I think it's it's leveraging um, the latent labor pool in China and 
<clears throat> making it easier for people to do to do businesses part-time, right? Like I think a two, uh, 15 years ago, maybe Taobao was one of the primary ways and it still is, but I think now there's a lot more opportunities like that. And that's overall, I, I think a really good thing. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Joy. Indeed, right now, especially with this Diban Jinji as well, right? We see it just all across the country. People in uh, higher tier cities, as you said, they might have on the side their uh, Taobao store. They might be doing so many other things. But also people in lower tier cities, they can, again, uh, make sure that they go to the markets or do some uh, roadside uh, selling. At the same time, they can live stream as they do that and merge online to offline experience and essentially have this side hustle running. Uh, let me do very quick 30 second reset of the group here. I see a lot of new people joining us. So guys, today we are having this uh, Digital China Day. We're talking about Chinese digital trends. Right now, this session is about Chinese consumers. Next session, uh, which is going to come one and a half hours from now, is going to be on China's digital marketing. Um, then we have China's e-commerce and new retail. And finally, we're going to wrap up this day with luxury and experiences in China. This is a 12 hour session uh, and we have amazing speakers. So I would like to urge you to follow our incredible speakers on stage right now, along with your our humble moderators as well. So we are all long term China watchers with hands on the ground. And uh, we have Holger, Zui, Etanyu, Manchu and Alvin here with us uh, as well. Um, now, I would like to uh, also mention to you that we are going to finish in about 20 to 25 minutes this section where only the speakers uh, on stage are sharing and then we're going to open floor for questions so please be uh, with us and stay patient now uh, a question to our phenomenal panel would be how do brands act on these consumer behaviors and the changes in mindset? As mentioned, we just now spoke about, you know, silver head generation, but at the same time, we have so many interesting subgroups. We've said that Gen Z is what everybody is watching around the world and Chinese Gen Zs are changing so rapidly. And again, they are very different uh, depending whether we're looking at lower tier city or higher tier city. They have so many new subcultures being birthed there. Then we have super moms. They've been on every brand's radar for years. And even Taobao, Tmall's kind of preferred categories of businesses that they want to attract uh, onto the platform from overseas, you know, super moms and uh, baby and mother products were always one of the top. Right now, we also have a huge pet economy. There's more and more pet lovers in China, especially younger people that look at pets as their uh, potential kids. We have powerful women, women above 30 that right now want to make their own decisions in life and do not want uh, society to that extent dictate how uh, she shall be essentially happy. We have happy singles as well. We have lower tier city youth. So just pick a category and let's talk about how brands can truly, uh, you know, use this opportunity with this specific uh, consumer group in China in order to build their success in the market. Anyone on the panel? I want to give you an example about a cosmetic brand that was formed actually last year called PMPM. Um, so the founder, she actually used to work at Olay and she was a marketing director. Um, she built her brand around her like inspirations from international travel destination because she herself has traveled around the world for a year when she was taking a gap year. I thought it was really interesting to tap into people's desire to travel and now she has ingredients from uh, all over the world and different products and the way she did her marketing was very smart uh, based on her background working at big global cosmetic brand um, so she uh, looked at um, I think one recommendation I noticed is to making one super popular product like uh, Bao Kuan. So she had one product and then um, using Kuai Shou. So she studied the user base and kind of defined her user segment, the first kind of uh, group of users. And then she um, uh, she hired different KOLs on Kuai Shou and made different video, short videos. And she did a calculation about how many ads, she, how many KOLs she needs to work with and to getting um, a the first sales to make that 
single product popular. And when a single product become popular, it builds the brand around it. I just want to give this example because I think this founder of this cosmetic brand really thought about her user segment. It's like the um, third or fourth year college students who is having their first uh, cosmetic exper experience. They could not really afford big international brands, but really want to have a, a very good product. So um, just one example. This is such an interesting uh, build, Chen Yue, just inspired. It's almost like a sub-segment of first-time cosmetic buyer from second, third, third, third tier. So within second, third tier, you can break down. Within cosmetics, you can break down. And that's a very good example. Please don't forget to drop this brand name and screenshot in the WeChat group because more can benefit from this example. Thank you. And if anybody else wants to comment on how can brands and service providers engage with these consumer groups in China for better impact, please go ahead. Yeah, actually, I want to give a, an example that just happened a few weeks ago um, that we worked with at Balenciaga on their fall product line launch. And what they did was they created an entire fashion show instead of in the real world because they couldn't get people together. They put them into virtual reality and uh, allow anybody uh, with a phone or a VR device to roam into this 3D space and see the virtual avatar, their, the clothes on their virtual avatars. Um, what they also did was to send uh, our VR devices uh, with the preloaded content of this, of this virtual world to uh, several hundred uh, key opinion leaders uh, globally and about a hundred of them in China. Uh, and this essentially got them coverage in pretty much all of the major fashion magazines uh, telling, talking about how innovative they were in creating a new, uh, a new way for people to experience their brand uh, while avoiding uh, all the physical uh, risks that are in the rest of the world. So that was something that I think is, is actually quite innovative in terms of uh, what's happening in terms of a brand using new technology uh, to both battle the current COVID limitations as well as uh, getting a lot of interest from young people. They got uh, tens of millions of views uh, on, on that, um, on that uh, fas virtual fashion show. So just, uh, you know, anybody wants to look up, it should be, there should be videos of that on, uh, on YouTube or on WeChat. Great example. In fact, right now, a lot of things are going virtual and marketing as well. Uh, looking at all product categories, including luxury. Right now, we have luxury live streams, luxury fashion shows. Um, we have also B2B events, in fact, also running on live streaming, right? When people are meeting in the physical space for expos. And at the same time, uh, half of the time, people are speaking to a live streamed audience. So uh, it's very, very interesting. Definitely check out this example of uh, virtual um, fashion shows. Anybody else? How can brands and service providers engage with Chinese consumers for better impact? Would love to hear your examples. Yeah, so perhaps I can kind of speak to the happy singles that you mentioned. And so the general trend is that people are getting married um, and having babies later in China, especially in the city, whether that's by choice or not, um, factors including like careers or just simply having more options in life um, and not seeing getting married as the only way in life, right? So we're looking at like people that are actually um, marrying a lot later, um, comparing, you know, uh, 1990 to 2016 data, we're seeing both men and women marrying basically three years later. So um, when they, people choose to have babies, they're also having less baby as well. So um, we, last year, I think we saw like the lowest birth rate since 1961. Um, a year year decline of uh, 30%, but also that has to do with COVID as well. But I, I think generally speaking, the birth rate has been declining, people marrying a lot later. So we're looking at uh, them having higher discretionary spending. Um, they they most likely gonna look into spending more on entertainment, recreation and travel as well. 
And I think, generally speaking, um, with singles, they are more likely to seek out communities, whether that's like online, or offline. Um, this could be like interest-based group hobbies, volunteering, or even for social goods as well. And I think I mentioned before the lifestyle upgrade. So now, so this group has more money. They are looking to buy products, upgrade in their spending, looking for things that um, you might not have think of. Um, like I mentioned before, we talk about like a um, hair dryer that could be controlled with a smartphone. Um, being here in the States, most of the time, I, I just really can't think about owning something like that <laughs> or, um, you know, spending on, obviously, um, EV has been really hard in China and and I, I believe uh, luxury goods, um, but the uh, singles are making a, a large portion of the buyers. Absolutely. And to build on what you've just now said, a lot of singles are also fueling up the home economy. And home economy can be translated in a lot of uh, different scenarios that you can essentially exercise at home. But also, in particular, the fact that right now decorating your own home and living space is becoming a very big thing. So previously, you would move outside of your parents' house or you would actually live with your parents for the longest time. So right now, many young people, especially in higher tier cities, um, are moving out, so they have their own space, and they don't just have a shabby little apartment, but they love to decorate it to make sure that they have a corner for stationery if they love stationery, a corner for fitness if they love fitness, a corner for mixing uh, cocktails if they love mixing cocktails, and building it all, all at home. And that is why these small home appliances to make sure that they can, you know, also cook for themselves, but also the cute design is very, very important for them. Uh, this very gentle light that looks like candle light that you put uh, at the bedside uh, of your apartment. And sometimes they can be so expensive. There's there's actually a brand, uh, uh, Beast Beauty, if I'm not mistaken, in China that is specifically uh, selling uh, flowers and roses that are preserved and they can stay up for years. So you would buy something like this with a light for hundreds of RMB to just decorate your apartment and make it more cozy. And again, this trend is very often driven not only by young people, Gen Zs, millennials, but also by this specific happy singles uh, group in higher tier cities. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Oh, I wanted, <laughs> if, I, if I may jump in, I was just going to say that um, uh, this happy singles phenomenon, I think is relatively recent because when I was living in China, I actually still have a, um, I still have a, a copy of a magazine. So self magazine, which is like, I guess, primarily read by women. And I remember at the time I had turned, I think, 35. And my friend asked me, or 30, like 34, 35. And my friend had asked me if she could feature me for happily single, which was, which was at the time, you know, if you were 35 and married was like, really, really, uh, a big deal, even in first tier cities. But I'm happy to see that even in just the last few years, that has changed quite a bit. Um, I see a lot more um, women, especially talking about, uh, you know, pro like prolonging their singlehood so that they could find, you know, the right partner or just, it, it, or just like not seeking marriage at all if they feel fulfilled by themselves. And I think overall, this is part of a larger trend I see towards focusing on the self and focusing focusing on mental well-being instead of being so achievement oriented. And uh, so I actually went and uh, studied psychology after I came back to the States, but uh, I was really interested in seeing the rise of psychology also in, in China because mental health in the past had not been a very big aspect of the culture. Um, it was highly stigmatized. Um, I think prior to 2017, in, in general, like depression was just not even very well understood. And some of the startups I talked to were, they, they saw a lot of need, but it was very hard for them to market. Uh, but nowadays, I, I see more and more, um, you know, this idea of well-being, not just on the physical side, physical fitness is very big, but mentally being very, very popular with uh, not just urban Chinese, but but even, you know, more rural uh, Chinese. And I think like Chen Yu, you also have seen this be like a huge driver behind uh, your own business, right? As well as the brands you work with. 
Right, exactly. Um, notice more and more um, women become independent and really want to become themselves. And they buy products that um, reward themselves. Like um, maybe because I work with um, a lot of yoga brands and yoga has become a very well sought after um, lifestyle exercise kind of space. Um, and many people buy a Lululemon become, because they, not only because it's like something very desirable, it has certain status, but also kind of reward themselves to become better version of themselves. And more and more women um, in late 20s or early 30s um, choose to do more travel to kind of uh, enrich their own experience and uh, waiting to find the right partner. So a lot of my friends in Shanghai, I, I, when they come to um, have coffee in, in my, um, uh, my, my studio, uh, I notice a lot of our single, uh, very talented girls. That's a big trend. So that's why the pets economy is getting so big. And many, many people are raising cats and especially cats in big cities. And some who has more space or time would have dogs. And there are some companies, um, not only the pet food, but also like there are some fashion brands with a vet called Vet Trasca. Um, they do like certain furnitures for the pets. So even any segment in China would have a big user base. Just curious, guys, this is very interesting, Ray and Chen Yu uh, and, and um, Holger and Manchin and Alvin. Uh, okay, for a second, if we flip the coin, and we assume, okay, for let's say, I don't want to just say Ikea because I don't know exactly how they define their audience, but let's just take an example of Ikea or this pet furniture brand. If they identify happy singles as their sub-segment, the question which probably can come to the mind is, how do we leverage them? How do we go defining further how to first identify the right subsegment? Second, how to leverage it best for building my brand and growing my business? So how would you recommend from your experience to leverage the right subsegment? And is it right or wrong for you? Anybody? Holger or Chen Yue? You're asking how a brand identifies their subsegment? Yeah, like how, let's say you identified that, oh, I think happy singles would be a good potential. How do mm -hmm. you actually go about uh, leveraging it? And how do you validate it's the right or the wrong from your real experience? I mean, I can I maybe talk super briefly about case studies I've seen. I don't operate a, a company, I operate a consultancy. So, but the, some of the companies that you see really succeeding in China right now are basically brands that apply what I would call internet thinking to their operations, right? So you have, um, you have brands that are now effectively putting out ads even before the product is made and then doing A-B testing and then uh, utilizing the data to then then make whatever it is they need to because China has, um, excuse me, like a very advanced supply chain. So you actually could do that. Even in 2019, when I was visiting um, one of the live streaming e-commerce platforms, they were telling me that they were already working with suppliers and could make clothes uh, within seven days. And, and you see now like a lot more brands being able to do this at scale, uh, which is like, I think about half the time of Zara is, is what I read. Um, and, and you see people apply this to not just uh, apparel, but also I think drinks, uh, any kind of consumable um, or yeah, any kind of consumer product. Uh, you, you see people doing this, doing very, very quick um, testing. And then I think a great example of, um, someone who really leverages data is Perfect Diary, right, which just went public on the U.S. stock market as Yatsen Group, um, the, the holding company. And Perfect Diary worked with something like over, uh, they, they divulged in their perspectives, I think, that they worked with over 15,000 influencers on Xiaohongshu, uh, which is one of these influencer marketing platforms. And that's, so what, when brands are thinking of who to work with, you might have to be, yeah, you shouldn't necessarily think of like, oh, I'm just have one big campaign, right? It's just like this endless stream of testing, data-driven marketing, and then finding the best way to acquire and engage and retain your customers. 
Adding on to Ray's uh, examples, uh, I, I identified two kind of groups. The first is the um, traditional supply side manufacturing. They turned into their own brand. Like there it was um, luggage and uh, luggage brand. They used to do um, supply chain for Samsung Light and many international brands. And now because Chinese consumers are ready to uh, they are ready to 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 um, welcome new brands. So they already have the big ready to go supply chain um, and many many years of experience. So so they actually turn into their own brands. And many brands under the I think the Xiaomi families uh, have their own used to be supply chain companies. Uh, so so I think that's one important uh, consideration. And the second one is the um, KOL um, have their own brands because as in KOL you work with many brands and actually you are diluting your um your uh, your your fans exposing them to so many brands and many people many KOLs would think that I already have the supply chain at my fingertip I can just go and produce my own brand brand why not having my own brand so that's how they also identify their user base it's like um, KOLs already having having fan base like for example Zhuzi, she's one of the top vlogger in china um and after making many years of videos now she has her own fashion brand so it's a very natural transition and there is another kol in the um uh, in the wine industry so now she also has her own brands too so i think that's two big trends that's happening um in China. And the third one is many talented individuals used to work in marketing for like Olay or L'Oreal um, and other international groups. And they see big opportunity in China. Uh, so they also form their brands with their strong domain knowledge. Actually, just reminded me, uh, absolutely, the last point you made is a huge trend. Uh, also, recently being seen a lot of people, for example, companies like Unilever, um, a big, you know, big group of people, let's say from the R&D side of Unilever, will quit their jobs uh, to start uh, a startup within the Xiaomi ecosystem. It's called Simple Way, and it's doing extremely well. They are one of the top leading uh, partners of Xiaomi ecosystem and they're all ex Unilever but all from the R&D department they have that talent and they have the vision to create something in this creator's economy so yeah thank you so much for this great share Ash, yeah Nishta to yeah go ahead oh Harvey. sorry all right just to, to briefly answer your question you asked how do you understand mindsets the various techniques um one of the techniques that we use for brands is to um, look at their personal narratives, um, which comes from narrative psychology, and to, to understand um, their internal people's internal conflicts, because those are key drivers. And uh, with an, a history as rich as China, and I'm not looking at uh, the distant history, but the last 20, 30 years. So what people have experienced is much, much richer than what we have experienced in the West, if we um, those of, of us who have been uh, living in the West for the last, um, for the major parts of the years. So they've got a much, much richer, uh, diverse and complicated, if you want to use that word, um, personal history. And that's, um, um, that's a treasure mine uh, for um, personal conflicts, for identity conflicts and actually uh, motivations. How do I want to create? How do I want to change? How do I want to live my life? So that's one way of um, really understanding um, your target consumers uh, and also then identifying the differences, you know, the subsegments. you know, what are these different mindsets and where do they come from and why are the, which ones are really powerful? And the other one, the other question was, how do you leverage them? Um, a very small example, a friend of mine, she's recently set up her own jewelry brand, Silver Jewelry. And what she does is she um, she doesn't market them the traditional way, you know, with glossy, um, nice um, photography, um, that too, but that comes later. She tells stories. She takes um, ancient Chinese fables, um, stories, um, fairy tales, and retells them in uh, adapted to a modern context and um, puts them out on her Xiaohongshu account or other accounts. 
and um, which is her Zhong Cao technique. So in order to get recommendations to to build a fan base. And what she does then interacting with her fan base with when she identifies certain, you know, reactions, um, certain groups, she asks them, can, how do you, how does it play out in your life? What I'm, what I'm talking about here, you know, some of her themes are um, male chauvinism and patriarchal society, fairness or the lack of fairness in society, whatever. She, she, she picks several uh, different um, social topics, um, relevant topics. And then she asks people, so how do you contribute? How does, how does it apply to your life? Do you want to tell me your story? And so people in the comments, they, they offer their own stories, very small, sometimes longer. And then she processes, with their permission, processes them into, into another edition, another episode of her story. And um, that kind of gives people a feeling of being included, being talked to. Also, as I mentioned earlier, becoming creators here, in this case, um, storytelling creators. And, um, and yeah, and, and um, they obviously discovered what she's um, also doing in terms of what kind of product she's offering in, offering and um, how it relates to the content that she offers. So that's just a very, very small example. She just recently launched, and uh, but it's rapidly growing. So that's an interesting example of how to connect emotionally also and in an emotionally relevant way connect with um, consumers. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Holger. And that would be great if in our speakers uh, and our attendance room, you would actually uh, drop us her Xiaohong Shu account number so we could all check out uh, her amazing interpretation of traditional Chinese stories. That's a great example. Uh, a very yeah, quick reset. Thank you so much, Holger. A very quick reset. So uh, for to all of those that are newly joining us, we have our 12-hour session on digital China today. And we are right now in session number uh, two. We're talking about Chinese consumers. This is the time when we open the floor for questions. So we'll have one hour discussion, not only questions, but also your contributions, anything that you would like to essentially add on the topic of Chinese consumers, uh, you know, in 2021. If you would like to ask a question or contribute, please make sure that you go to your profile and you change your bio, the first line in your bio, you put a word question, if you have a question, and you can give a few bullet points, what do you want to ask, or contribution, and you say contribute, I want to contribute X, Y, Z, and then raise your hand. The moment you raise your hand, I'm going to bring you on stage and we're going to have a great interaction, discussion, and we're looking forward to your commentary right now. I see one person here um, raising the hand and Jenna Cardo, if you would like to just mention to us first whether you have a question or a comment, we're going to bring you on. While you guys are all changing your bios and raising hands, make sure also to um, go to Peggy's uh, profile picture. You will see that Peggy's profile, profile picture right now is a QR code. That QR code is leading you to our closed WeChat group for speakers um, and participants and attendees. And you will be able to essentially network with people, ask your questions in the group as well. And please note that the um, max for this group is 200 people. We are right now just 10 people away. So grab your chance to follow the QR code and add yourself onto the group. And also remember to follow these speakers on stage because everybody here is a phenomenal uh, China expert and watcher. Um, now, Jenna Cardo, I hope that I pronounced your name correctly. Please let me know uh, whether you have a question or a comment. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for inviting me today. And I'd like to uh, say good morning and good evening to everyone. Um, this is really, I, I follow you all on Clubhouse, and I think it's absolutely an amazing pool of, of like-minded, really professional people. Um, and I'd just like to make that statement first. And then secondly, I've been listening all morning, and I've been picking up on previous conversations, and I understand that there's a, a delay with with so many people being interested in the group. So I just wanted to make one or two com uh, observations, not so much questions, um, which are quite positive about the Chinese digital landscape and about the consumer, how the consumer is behaving. So if you don't mind, I would like to just make two, state two, two observations. Number one, um, since I've been in China since 2008, I've seen a, a massive shift between your average consumer engaging online and also 
your mom and pop engaging online. And we're involved at the moment with an environmental company that we're busy rebranding. And what a fantastic point is that I saw with, with the brand that we're working with in Shanghai and in Hangzhou is both brands asked us to help them engage their consumers both online and offline to helping them develop by helping them develop their brand i'm sorry i'm sorry to hide your i unfortunately we cannot hear you very well uh, can you please yeah can you please uh move a little bit closer Let to it. the to the speaker sorry. thank you so much sorry and uh, let's sorry. let's keep sorry our comments also to about two minutes so uh sure. let's make sure that they are quick and we would absolutely love to hear your cases thank you thank you so in the cases in perspective is that our clients have reached out to us and asked us to help engage the consumer, both mom and pop to your newbie, and to do that through brand culture, to establish their brand culture. And I thought this was really interesting that this kind of development is taking place, that Chinese brands are taking cognizance of the fact that brand culture plays such an important role in being digitally online and understanding the, the, your customer online. And then another good case study that we're working on as well is the role of sustainability and being environmentally aware and how does that roll out onto your digital platforms and into your digital marketing and how do you implement that? And I thought this was really remarkable that China is making such great strides forward in making sure that they actually have a brand culture that emphasizes their sustainable message and also that they want to reach your youth on their digital platforms as well as mom and pop who have just learned how to use mobile apps. And that's another great avenue for education and training, which are your elderly generation. The why, that saying where you say, I wasn't born yesterday. Um, and I think that's a really great movement forward. And I see a lot of people are actually now taking note of these changes and implementing them into their strategies. So as an agency, we, we like to help regenerate businesses through their marketing and brand strategies, but we also do it through education and awareness. And I think the digital age, actually, like you, Truth wrote, rightfully said, is, is booming and there's so many opportunities. It's about how you find the right mix for your client that is important. Thank you very much for letting me just give two examples. Um, and I look forward to hearing more from all of you today. And thank you very much for having this day today. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So very interesting, right? Sustainability. In fact, sustainability is becoming a bigger, bigger topic. And I would like to address our panel. Do you feel that right now Chinese consumers really care about sustainability? Because I've heard both yes and no. Uh, some people say that, yes, they sort of care, but they're not willing at this stage to pay for it or they are not voting with their dollars when it comes to a more sustainable but more expensive product. Or do you have other examples? Like who is willing to go full on into the sustainability message and uh, uh, direction and who is not yet ready it would be very interesting to hear from the panel. Uh, perhaps I could uh, give some examples because I work with different sustainability brands on a daily basis. I think right now um, a lot of a brand that's eco-friendly is actually more expensive. So there is a discussion about whether sustainability is affordable. Um, but giving the example of um, plant-based meat like omni pork, um, actually pork is becoming very expensive in China, but uh, omni pork product is actually cheaper than pork. So when it's certain brands with um, um, more sustainability in their in their ethos, uh, but actually is affordable on a daily basis, I think it, it's easier to become more mainstream. So that's one example. And the other example is, um, so I work with, um, like my, my uh, ethos is like, um, sustainability is not something very far away from people's daily life, but actually making it more accessible uh, into a daily habit. For example, there is a coffee brand that we can all take a look at. It's called Manor Coffee. They have over 90 spots, um, shops in China, uh, sorry, in Shanghai. It's very, very small, like often under 
like 15 square meter space and they have a huge volume. They, their uh, slogan is making coffee part of a life. And they are, since five years ago, they started um, basically you bring your own cup and they give you five RMB off. And they sell coffee at about 15 to 20 RMB each. So it's like really big discount. So that actually helped helped many consumers to have this habit of bringing their own cup. So I think even from small habits, like bringing your own cup is cultivating a mindset for sustainability. I think there is a long way to go for the mainstream to take on sustainability. But if you make that into people's daily habit and make it easy for people to do, um, I think there is more and more people uh, going into the conscious community. Thank you so much, Chanue. Uh, we'd like to welcome a very, very interesting and experienced uh, industry veteran, Richard, here. Thank you, Richard, for joining. And after Richard, Michelle can uh, share her point of view. And I happened to meet Richard in person with the Clubhouse uh, gang uh, in Shanghai last night uh, to exchange learnings. Uh, Richard has so much experience in terms of the changing mindsets of the Chinese consumers and sub-segments and what is rapidly behind this change. Richard, do you want to do, give a quick introduction and your observation or any example? Great. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I just I apologize. I just joined the last half an hour, so I'm going to try to pick up a little bit on the conversation. I would just say a couple of things. I was born in Shanghai, have kind of made a little bit of my tour of duty um, around the world. I spent time in Europe, in US and Japan, Southeast Asia, and now back to Shanghai, my hometown. Um, I came to Shanghai 2003 to set up Nike's advertising agency called Wyden Kennedy, WK. And uh, since then, I decided to work more on education and how do we connect the less obvious dots of education, um, city, brands, IP, as well as uh, KOL and media. Um, when I say education, we also very much refer to lifelong education. That means platforms like TED, Singularity University, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to, I just picked up on two, 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 two keynotes conversation that I'm going to uh, react a little bit on. Um, I know the time is about two minutes, so I'm going to be fast. Um, there is um, there's a there's 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 a grouping of companies a little bit like leads for architecture called B Corp, Better Corporation or B Lab, coming out from US. They've been established probably about fourteen to 10, 14 years ago, and the incredible thing of B Lab was when I last went deep and followed them and researched. There were about 300 companies uh, for, uh, uh, under them about two years ago. 2020 just went wild. With everything happening around us and everybody have time to stay home and think about the values, B Corp now is at 2,700 companies. So it's one of the organizations that just, just really exponentially grew. Um, that idea really make us think about this is really the time I'm using this with government, with universities, with corporations. If you don't change right now, I don't know if there's another time that is as, as, as powerful as now. Everybody's listening for leadership. Everybody's listening for voice to how do we, do, how do we be better. They have time to listen. So really, companies, city government, universities, uh, uh, and various different platforms, this is really the time to act. I'm going to talk a little bit about brands because I think I've heard a few people mention it. There's something that's reasonably interesting to think about. What is the difference between IP and a brand? I think um, I, I actually thought of this question when I was listening to some speaker right before this. I have a feeling that brand change is incremental. It's very, gra it's very gradual. Excuse my dogs. And IP change is massive. IP change basically means that you have the opportunity to take the, to take the IP and really run with it. To do, to do because brand is controlled by so 
entities. And um, I will share with some of you uh, a project that we that we very hesitantly and and um, with mu with not much too much confidence um, that we built in Shanghai about fourteen months ago. It's called TXY High, and um, it is two hundred fifty thousand square feet, twenty five thousand square meter of space in Guanghai Lu in the center of Shanghai. And um, the, the mandate was given by the Shanghai government to, to say, tell us, study what is the future of commercial real estate, the future of brands, and future of retail. Because they realize how, how can brick and mortar fight and argue with e-commerce? And what is the right formula to bring the two together? So we did a one-year study of this, and we built a project in one year. And um, to our surprise, it has become the second most visited place in Shanghai um, because we have kept it at 22% um, no rental. That means it is entirely based on pop-up. And that model, we never knew that it could work because we say how many people would really come in and experiment so we built a very incredible team of advertising agency, graphic designer, KOLs, interior design, and digital, digital team to actually crisscross all of this. And as a one-stop shop, we take any brands, Chinese and international, and we can accelerate them in, in for, for them in one week's time. And um, we put a few different formulas in there. We, we brought in Team Lab as a partner. So Team Lab is working with a um, night entertainment group called Master to create uh, one of the most amazing light show um, for, for adults in the evening. And so we take various different IP and we stretch it. IP that is already famous, everybody wants, like Team Lab. And we say, what have you not done before? We have not seen you to do anything for adults. You have done it for young, young families, uh, immersive digital. Now we have turned it into the one of the top nightclubs in in China, and um, thank you, Richard. Top, I'm going to move on. Okay, I'll pass it on to you. No, that that that's a good example. I mean, I love your your you know how you put it in words, talking about brands and IPs, and you know what the difference there is. I think that's incredibly valuable. Um, w let me just bring Michelle on to build on what you've just now said, and also share her insight into the. Um, you know, some of the consumers like plant-based and veg tech companies. And uh, yeah, Michelle, um, you're on. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks a lot. Um, and, and great sharing, Richard. Um, I, I guess I wanted to uh, come up. I, let me just explain. I, I lived in uh, Beijing for two years uh, back in 2004 to 2006. Um, and, and then after that, moved to Dongguan uh, in southern China, um, and was living uh, in Dongguan for about seven, eight years uh, before actually be well, kind of going between Dongguan and Hong Kong. So I've been in Asia since 2004 in the in the China area, um, and I was working on a fashion brand at the time, um, uh, doing uh, footwear, coincidentally. Um, as well. Um, so I have a lot of branding experience, but now I've kind of done a dive into uh, nutrition and uh, uh, climate change and, and a, a lot of things around those issues and have been following the plant-based movement pretty carefully um, because I'm also working with a startup uh, here in Hong Kong that's focused around doing an alternative protein that's made from uh, at microalgae. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to contribute earlier when we were talking a little bit about the plant-based movement, um, just talking about some of the brands like where Green Common had just opened up their new shop in, in Shanghai. And, you know, basically the, you know, from, from what I'm seeing in the, in the media, just following it very closely is that the tables are always booked and um, people really like this healthy style of eating. And I think the China government has also back in 2016 uh, made a determined effort to kind of say we're, we're eating too much meat and it's not sustainable. So, you know, within the alternative protein space, there have been a lot of companies that have 
uh, opened up within China um, from gen meat in, in Beijing to hao food and hero protein. Um, hay meat is another one. So there's there's quite a few brands that are coming into this space trying to um, you know provide a solution to to people eating you know more healthy for one and also more responsibly for the environment because I think that uh, the the China government is really seeing that it could be a, a crisis into the future where there is maybe not enough food from the traditional sources and also from resources uh, destroying the environment. They want to get you know ahead of that curve, I think. Absolutely. So if anybody uh, on the panel has any additional insights or wants to build on something Richard and Michelle just now said, please go ahead. And if not, we are moving on to Ryan. I just brought Ryan on stage. Who's got 350,000 followers on TikTok? Ryan, do you have a question or would you like to share? Hi, uh, I do have a question, but I just popped in. So it's I don't know if it's exactly what you're talking about, but it is, I think, about a, a tech trend going on in China right now. Is that okay if I ask it? I'm not sure if you guys have a Absolutely. specific Absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, cool. <laughs> So um, I love China. I um, own a skincare brand and I do so much work with partners in China for packaging and things like that. And I just like love learning about the tech that they use. Even just like, I think WeChat is so cool. I wish that it was like bigger here in North America. Um, I'm from Canada. Um, there's an app that I've seen in China being used in China. I don't know what it's called, but it's the one where you can basically watch people sell products and it's almost like TikTok and they're sort of like live selling products and you can listen to them, give their pitch and you can just like swipe through. Does anybody know the app that I'm talking about? There's several ones. You might be thinking of Kwaisho. Okay. Yeah. I don't know the name of it, but um, it looks, it just looks so cool. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on, if you think that kind of technology is like appropriate for North American markets, if you guys foresee that coming to North America as a popular app, because when I see it as a brand owner, I'm like, oh my God, I wish that that's something that people in North America use. I wish we had it here because I would love to be on there, you know, pushing my product. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Ashley, that's that's up your uh, ballpark. You're an expert on live streaming. Right. Do, uh, do you want to give a quick overview? Sure. Thanks so much, George. Yeah. So when it comes to uh, Chinese uh, digital and social media ecosystems and live stream e-commerce ecosystems, of course, the platforms are quite unique. China has up until right now more than 60 social media platforms unique to that market and over 100 platforms that have live streaming function. So that is why when you say there's a very cool app that has like live streaming that you can swipe left and right, we have uh, dozens of those in operation on a you know any given day. Um, when it comes to them coming to you know international markets, uh, I think there are a lot of challenges. Challenges in the way that users behave. Challenges in the fact that um, you know the ecosystem is not built out for this because these apps were created specifically for China ecosystem. The fact that the supply chain is um, created a certain way, the fact that creators are also working a certain way. Many of them, creators in China, are actually part of MCN, multi-channel network, or these kind of builders of creators, right? These are big companies that help you curate, select um, the products, make sure that they have a clear supply chain and distribution formats. And uh, creators essentially are supported by teams to make sure that they do uh, content creation well. So um, I wouldn't be, I, I, I mean, obviously tech companies in China are looking into going global and we've seen, you know, TikTok uh, going international, uh, etc. However, I don't see, you know, smaller companies immediately expanding into overseas markets. And also when Chinese tech giants that are planning to expand into, into outside of China, they primarily start with places like Southeast Asia, Africa, a Russian-speaking world, and Latin America, rather than going, as you said, North America and Europe, because of, again, uh, ecosystem, just the readiness of consumers, and also some technology uh, slash privacy issues that are not easily resolved. So this is just a very, very quick overview of what's going on, and I'm sure that Nishna has uh, a couple of other pointers that she might give. 
Yeah, just a very quick build, uh, Ryan. Uh, not sure if I understood clearly. Is that you want to start operating and expanding more in China, or you want to leverage this feature within your ecosystem in the US, in the in Canada? But either way, just yeah. a quick note that. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah. I, I what I was asking is like, I think it works slow. Like, so, it'd be so cool if we had it here in Canada and the U.S. So I would just love to use it here as a brand owner to reach like people in North America, basically. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sure somebody must be thinking about this, so you can give uh, feedback. But definitely, it must be in the works. Uh, but just a quick note for anybody who might be interested that foreigners are not allowed uh, in terms of the legal identity of being having a foreign passport, not directly allowed to live stream in China unless they partner up uh, with a local KOL or you know build their brand. So I think just linking back to a great um, insight being shared earlier by Holger and team is storytelling and narratives. If uh, somebody wants to get into live streaming, the best way is not to jump directly into live streaming if you're a new brand or a new upcoming brand. It's mostly to build your narrative and storytelling for that market, starting with a certain platform. So go small, but go deep. That's the learning we've got. So we can probably have a reset of a room, Ashley, and then uh, do the last 30 minutes Q&A before we move on to more digital marketing section. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Richard, Michelle, Ryan, for joining us on stage here. Um, now, uh, we have a couple of new people joining us, so let me reset. Today, we're talking about digital China, and we have started this day. It is a 12-hour marathon that we started at 9 a.m. China time, and we're going to finish 9 p.m. China time today. We, had, we have already spoken about Chinese technology, innovation, and digital lifestyle. Right now, we are in our second session talking about Chinese consumers. Um, the next session coming up in 30 minutes will be on China's digital marketing, where we're going to do a deep dive into the platforms, content, bloggers, live, uh, live streaming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we're going to move on uh, into the next session for three hours together with George, uh, talking about e-commerce in China and, of course, China's Ooh. new retail. Yay! And the final session for today uh, between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. China time is going to be about China's luxury consumption consumers, innovation, works, etc. And of course, not only luxury products, but also luxury experiences. So this is our plan for today. And let me remind you guys to follow everybody on stage because we've brought you an amazing selection of China experts. Zui, Holga, Manchu, uh, Chen Yu, phenomenal, phenomenal experts. Definitely do follow your humble uh, servants for today and your moderators, Nishna, George, Peggy, are absolutely, absolutely amazing. If you would like to join... Um, uh, and basically ask us questions, join us here on stage and ask us questions or contribute to the discussion. Right now we're talking about Chinese consumers. Raise your hand. And uh, if you would like to contribute, make sure that your bio says contribute on top. If you would like to ask a question, just write question on top. Shall we, shall we continue, Ashley? <laughs> Absolutely, so why Michelle. You... And I, I just went silent what? and realized I'm silent. I'm, I'm checking people's profiles that they're raising hands. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. In some parts of the world, it's midnight. Some parts of the world, it's still early morning. And here in, Ch in China, it's like lunchtime. So people can grab their coffee and meal while they're listening to this as well. Just the last uh, 30 minutes, we want to get into more actionable takeaway insights or actions which can uh, benefit everybody here in the room. So in terms of consumers, we've discussed about sub-segments, the drivers, the examples. Now, the key question here on the table is how can brands or service providers engage these sub-segments better? You know, so we know the triggers and the, and the drivers, but how, what are the one or two tip for brands and service providers to engage these sub-segments better? So one example, again, can come to my mind when, when Holger said about uh, leveraging their Creativity, that is one thing. Don't assume they are just there to be advertised to, to talk down to or talked at to. How do we engage them as co-creators, creative partners? That's one way. Any others? Hi, um, I wanted to share some practical um, practical tips. If you have a brand and then if, if you want to test your product to see which segment really suits you, I think a very good channel is uh, Xiao Hong Shu, the red little the little red book, uh, which is like the Instagram for those who are not familiar. It's like the Instagram plus Pinterest in China, very 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 popular. Many many brands are using that. Um, 
perhaps working with KOCs <clears throat> with uh, fans. For example, you, you are testing two dom uh, two segments of users. You can find suitable KOCs by um, examining their followers and their posts and their engagement, and then you can do a product exchange for a post. So that's a low cost way to getting your product into the market and see which ones actually have conversions. And then maybe it helps you to gauge the next level of kind of marketing and the branding uh, uh, allocation. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And right now we have Ted uh, from the audience who's got a question to the panel. Ted. Hi, thanks for having me up. Um, I'm just curious how, if at all, um, our, um, uh, how are Chinese consumers in urban centers like Shanghai and Beijing and other large cities, how are they marketed to differently than those in uh, more rural areas? Or is there a difference? And how is the migration that continues into the urban centers, how is that changing uh, not only consumers, but how they're viewed at by, uh, by brands and companies? Beautiful question. Anybody on the... Well, let me begin then. When it comes to uh, lower and higher tier city consumers, uh, they definitely are marketed extremely differently. In general, in China, the whole ecosystem is very digital. So it means um, most of the spend in advertising is going into you know digital marketing and social media platforms, uh, e-commerce platforms as well. But the platforms are sometimes different. For example, in higher, higher tier cities, people are uh, you know, watching more of uh, spending more time on red and watching more uh, Douyin and in lower tier cities, still Kuai Shou is a bit more popular and people go on to Pindor doors a lot more. Uh, right now, for example, in higher tier cities, a very important and uh, interesting way to promote is to actually put your physical product in the uh, pick up locker. So there are those lockers all across China where you're ordering something from, from for instance, uh, Taobao. And the, it's in your community, there's a big locker where your parcel has been dropped uh, off. So uh, you can promote by putting a QR code on the locker. And also, so basically when the person scans the QR code to retrieve their parcel, they open it, they see a pop-up window with your advertising, and they also get the little sample of whatever you want to offer them um, as the food, et cetera, et cetera. So in first year cities, that's very big right now because you can target specifically a very specific neighborhood where people live um, and it can be a luxurious estate and you are uh, with very high chance it's going to reach uh, super, super cool people. In lower tier cities, we also see a lot of banner advertising. We definitely see a lot of uh, gaming going on and different types of games. We see that people in lower tier cities in general, again, this is a lot of generalizations, but they have a lot more time um, and they get online a bit earlier. In first tier cities, people get online at about 9 uh, to 10 p.m. Um, as one of their most active times. And they have this um, nighttime economy where everybody stays up until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. And in fact, some of the most effective advertising times especially for younger people that are working in, you know, white collar environments is, you know, uh, evening from about 9 p.m. to about 1 a.m. But when it comes to lower tier cities, people generally have a bit less uh, pressure and a bit more time. So you can advertise to them and market to them in very different environments. Another interesting point is that across China, and that might come counterintuitive, but giving out physical brochures actually works. So standing next to, I don't know, a coffee shop and giving out brochures with QR codes and saying, hey guys, come in, and all that actually does work. So that is happening in both higher and lower tier cities. So I hope that sets a little bit of stage on, you know, what happens uh, with different types of consumers. Ted, if you have more question uh, or anybody on the panel wants to contribute, please unmute yourself and speak. Yeah, Ashley, there was an important point uh, about the brochures, the physical world. Not everything is digital. Um, there's a lot of good examples as to how what is traditionally called below the line um, works. So events, um, certain activities, games, anything that involves people physically, mentally, spiritually, and it doesn't have to be digital only. Uh, in fact, the two should go hand in hand. Um, a lot of brands who've done that um, have seen tremendous impact on 
uh, on, on on their target customers, um, the the emotional involvement, the perception then of the brand, and and at the end of the day, what's most important, the perceived relevance of the brand to individual lives. So I think that was an important point there. It just reminded me just uh, three days ago, a um, series of people, you know, uh, got a box from to me, to me, uh, the, the carrier bags and, and suitcases brand, right? We all know that. And it was a combination of uh, traditional direct marketing big box along with digital interactive QR code in the box. And everybody was posting on WeChat, including myself. I received it and it just hit the nail uh, that digital does not mean only digital. It needs to be a combination of physical and digital. And uh, direct marketing is being reinvented as we speak now in China. So that's a very good reminder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Uh, I have also brought, and Ted, have we answered your question? Yes, thank you. That was great. Thank you. So it. now I have Alice on stage here with us. Alice, what is your question? Oh, okay. Let me introduce myself a little bit. I'm doing digital marketing <laughs> and I have my uh, creator uh, social media platform uh, for startup. Uh, I, I'm doing this research for a long time. Um, so I do like to talk to you guys because as you guys uh, talk about the marketing issue, but my English is not very good. Maybe some, you know, whenever I cannot explain very good, maybe someone can help. No worries. No, no problem at all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have some kind of, uh, you know, pain for the English trans translation, uh, you know, the um for content i have very good idea i know very good writing in chinese but when translate you know into english people don't understand let's say uh for the uh chinese say private domain traffic but in the united states no people say that right you can speak very good english maybe you can help me understand what that mean you know when we Talk about the private domain traffic in 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 US. I think this is pretty much like a influence marketing, right? So no more nobody hey, understand what yeah, I thought. Alice, can can you can you uh, just uh, once again explain it to me, just very very briefly? Let me listen into this. Okay, when Chinese say. Um, private domain line, uh, domain traffic is about Yes, 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 private traffic, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, but in the United States, when we try and translate, there is no words, you know, can exactly... Yes, but we, yeah. we call it private traffic. So within the China digital marketing community abroad, then we're using term private traffic. So building your own private traffic. And if you're talking about the person that is managing that community, we can say that uh, it, is, it can be your homegrown, like your brand KOC, key opinion consumer. At the same time, KOC, key opinion consumer can also be a base of consumers that are really fond of your product and are basically promoting on your behalf. So that's where the confusing part comes in with KOC. And, but the group of people who you can reach without paying to the platform for advertising, this is called private traffic group. Okay, okay. Yeah, I got it. Because, um, you know, when I wrote in Chinese, I got someone translate, they just said private domain traffic, so that people don't understand it. This is I... not, the, this is not right, right? Right. So it's saying private traffic, I believe within the proper circles is the right term to use at this stage. Yes. Okay. So oh, I, I'm always looking for a good English content writing. I don't know who can help. <laughs> I have a very good, you know, idea for my platform, connect business and the marketers. Means business in this platform uh, provide their, you know, um, information and also brand and the brand they cover and also create the offer. And uh, the marketers just show their profile like, like a LinkedIn, like a like um, Fiverr or something like that. 
you know, like how many so you know, like information about social handles and the audience size, something like that. And right. Then, Right, Alice. Um, that would be great if you would, uh, if you look above there is Peggy, uh, who is one of our moderators, and you will see that uh, her profile picture was changed to the QR code. This is a QR code for attendees of this session, and I'm sure you can drop an introduction about you know yourself and what you're trying to achieve with the uh, English language partner. Um, uh, you know, um, and I'm sure there would be people that might potentially. Mm, be interested in collaboration so you can uh, you can join that group and uh, message us on who you exactly you're looking and uh, other interested people will connect with you i hope that this it's will be already, helpful it's already full i tried 200 people already <laughs> well then the the, the next uh, the other thing that you can do you can uh, add peggy at shanghai peggy on wechat shanghai peggy and uh, oh. we will be able to pull you inside the group okay okay okay, okay. Thanks. Awesome stuff. Let Thank you so much. Where, where is the hyperpackage? <laughs> I don't see it. You can go to WeChat and add her WeChat ID, Shanghai Peggy. Okay. I'm yes. Fine. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. And now we are joined by Rainy. Rainy is joining us uh, here on stage. Uh, how can we help you, Rainy? Hi, Ashley. Thanks very much for, for bringing it up. Bringing it, bleh, sorry, my, my, my connection reception is not very well here. Thanks very much well. for bringing me up to the stage. Um, I, it's a lot of inspiring stories here already, and, and I think it's a great channel. Um, my question is actually um, regarding the, the sort of the debate between digital marketing um, versus um, ESG. So I was actually, I'm personally an advisor to, to a few um, family offices and high net worth individuals, and we there happened to be a chance I got into a, a debate with someone when I was introducing him about the e-commerce stocks in in China, and then suddenly I got into ask the question, you know, the social sort of e-commerce um, trends drove by say Pinduoduo or the other big e-commerce giants have become so viral, and marketing digital marketing has also become viral across various channels but how do you ensure that the marketing effort is is ethical um for the lack of better words and i'm not a marketing expert um but i heard there are a lot of marketing experts uh, in the panel and also in the room so just love to tap into your thoughts um what are the latest trends when conducting digital marketing or influence marketing how do you balance um between the content versus versus the sort of the ethical standards, again, for the lack of better words, what, excuse what, me if there should be right, better Rainey, words. And what, what do you mean? What, what I mean. do you mean by ethical standard? Like uh, you're, you're selling uh -huh. products that are hurting consumers or or uh, what, what do you mean by unethical marketing in this particular context? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so let me give an example. It might not be the best one, but um, in a few years ago, Baidu got caught in the news that their um, search engine ranking was purchased and the top ranked sort of ads, the actual provider wasn't even good enough. And they got into some, I think, medical hospital kind of tragedies. And they got into a huge sort of ethical debate of you pay a lot to get yourself at the top of, of the search engine. But the search engine is supposed to be a search engine for information to a certain extent rather than always ranked by who pays the most money and similar things got into other types of marketing you know so long as you have big bucks and pay a lot you seem to be able to influence a lot of people even if the product itself is not the best of the sort um i hope i explain myself well enough <laughs> Sure. Um, so just my uh, two cents when it comes to um, ethical marketing in your in your context, I would say that right now, uh, obviously, China operates in a slightly different setup than the rest of the world, when in the rest of the world, uh, governments uh, and regulatory organizations are very often trying to regulate before something happened. Um, you know, everything is prohibited unless it's specifically allowed. In China, everything is allowed unless it is specifically prohibited. So that is why we see sometimes that, you know, technology and sometimes, uh, you know, this tech uh, companies are also taking advantage of these uh, of these um, opportunities. So right now, as we've mentioned in our first panel today, we actually see China government stepping up and regulating a lot of areas from microfinancing to live streaming to bloggers 
through advertising. And in fact, last year was a very big year for advertising industry in China because we have been introduced into a lot of regulations. And right now, I'm not sure how many of us here um, you know, in the audience are familiar with that, but in China, when you publish something online, it's not just you as a uh, uh, publisher of this content who is responsible for the quality of the content and the fact that this is genuine information. But the platform is also responsible for it. And if there is an issue with the content I publish, let's say, on Facebook, it's not only me who is going to be deleted, fined, and you know potentially taken legal action against if my product is harmful or I misrepresent the truth, but also the platform itself, Facebook, that enabled me to public uh, publicly um, publish this content and reach people will be pu punished. So that is why a lot of self-regulation is also happening on the platforms. So right now, when you advertise with Baidu, uh, certain uh, industries cannot advertise at all, or you need to fall into the uh, top 100 companies in the world for a certain industry in order to be able to make certain claims. Uh, uh, Red, for example, Xiaohongshu went through a very big also clean sweep late 2019 and also in 2020, where they had a lot of advertising on, uh, you know, medical beauty and unlicensed um, services were rendered through this platform. So huge sweep, huge clean up. And this is just one way to look into it. But of course, um, when it comes to fast speed, there are still some companies and there's still some, you know, issues that the environment itself is trying to handle um, as fast as they can. But there's no guarantees. And I'm sure Nishna can, uh, can share more insights on that. No, just uh, I think this is a this is a huge topic and we can go on and on. But I believe the next section uh, will also actually connect the dots with the consumers. Just for the last 10 minutes of the section, as a closing remarks from everybody on the stage, what is that one great example or tip, practical example or practical tip, one thing uh, you would like to share with everybody in terms of engaging the Chinese consumers, specifically the sub-segments, better? Just as a takeaway closure on this and before we move on to the digital marketing session from starting in 15 minutes. One practical tip or, or so I'll give you my examples to, to kick off as a closure and then everybody can build on. Uh, when I was working uh, on the Starbucks delivery launch with the Starbucks team in China, um, uh, obviously, we realized that besides digitalizing and making sure the delivery is smooth, etc., and it's end-to-end, -end, it's as good as the offline store customer experience, we knew that one of the key experiences had to be linked back to the actual cup, the actual temperature, the actual spillage should be avoided when the delivery comes to your office or home. And one of the things uh, we drove is um, the co-creation in terms of scouting solutions for even the architecture of the cup and the, the temperature solution, everything in terms of co-creation with a segment of consumers and employees together. I'm a big believer of employee engagement and uh, consumers are not just people who consume outside of your office. Consumers are also the people who are sitting in your office who are co-creating on a daily basis. So one practical tip is, what we did on Starbucks is actually to find the problem, the root cause on how to avoid spillage and manage the temperatures better in 30 minutes delivery was actually to scout for solutions with the employees and a sample base of real consumers and co-create a solution within one month, went to market in six months and obviously prototyped it in that one to six months with the real people and with the factory and R&D, et cetera. So I think that's my tip please consider to engage your employees and real people in your product and service co-creation. Anybody else? Arnold, you or Holger. Holger, you work a lot also in terms of product and service innovation. Any tip on how to engage the consumers better? Um, yeah. Um, apart from what I've mentioned already in terms of talking down to them, treating them as creators, um, and people who know exactly um, what direction they want to go, they need stimulation. But another thing is um, um, brand loyalty. For a lot of people, a lot of friends have been complaining that brand loyalty has been uh, um, disappearing, um, which is not due to the consumer. It's due to the way a lot of brands communicate, position themselves and interact with the consumer. Um, most of them are using cookie cutter uh, approaches. Um, which then obviously doesn't help in terms of um, 
um, addressing the consumer in a in a way that feels relevant. So I think, um, as we mentioned at the beginning of this panel, um, you need to understand specific subgroups, subsegments, mindsets, and then try and connect with those mindsets and interact with the consumer in a more co-creative way. Use storytelling, understand what are the emotional tensions, what are the emotional conflicts, because um, at the end of the day, what we all want to do as human beings is uh, tomorrow become better versions of ourselves. And that's really what a brand should do uh, in terms of positioning, in terms of also the product attributes, um, as well as, of course, your brand story. So, yeah. Chen Yu, any last uh, closing remarks? Um, yes. So if you're a brand, um, I think a rel relatively new brand, I, I recommend actually focusing on one star product that you want the market to to know and use. And then um, testing it with different KOCs and see uh, who actually will buy your product. And when you're actually ready to launch a campaign, would have uh, actually carefully designed a, a campaign with the storytelling line, as well as um, a big KOL, one or two top tier KOL, who actually can um, be like the um, advocating for your brand, and then uh, many KOCs who have followers. So you really build um, a campaign around it. So then first you test your your product with different in influencers and their users. And then actually when you're ready to launch a campaign, um, do some uh, calculation as well with the data um, and then making one product really uh, popular. Uh, we call it true trend. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And this is gorgeous, guys. Thank you so much again for being with us today. And this goes to all the phenomenal panelists that are on stage right now. Um, we have uh, still um, three sessions to go. We have digital marketing session that is starting right now. Then we have our e-commerce and new retail session that is coming up three hours later. And then, of course, we're going to wrap up this 12-hour marathon with a luxury and experiences in China.